This story is something that I think about from time to time, and it creeps me out. Two, almost three years ago, I was 17 years old at this point. I was accustomed to being in horrible situations, as all I had was my mother, and she could not hold down a job for long because she had her own issues to tackle. And so as I grew up, we are in and out of friends' houses. We never really had a place to stay except twice, but that didn't last long either, and we would be forced into a new environment with a snap of a finger. So, when I was 17, we're led into a situation where we're going to be homeless again, and I was used to it at this point, as I'd slept in the street more than I'd like. The day comes when we have to leave our house, and my mom is able to stay at her boyfriend's trailer. I had nowhere to go as I had no friends at this point. I stopped my friendships because they were bad for my health and mental state, and overall they were toxic. My mom gave me the option to go with her, but I didn't want to, as I felt like I'd be getting between my mom and her boyfriend. Plus I'm used to the street, and I didn't think it was as bad as it was at the time. So here we are. I get dropped off at a McDonald's and I eat some burgers before I go off into the streets once more. Eventually, the sun fled and darkness was all that remained, and so I look for a place to sleep for the night. I went into many places that night trying to sleep, but none of them were working because it was either too hot or the lights were too bright or the mosquitoes were biting me. That's when I remember a house that I used to go into to chill in. This house was under construction and nearly finished, so the doors all shut and the windows were all settled, so there were no mosquitoes. I go through the back like always and I make my way upstairs. Eventually I settle in the bathroom because there's less debris on the floor, so I lay there and I try to sleep. I then hear some sounds downstairs and I don't think anything of it. I figured it was the door that I came through swinging open and close or something. Eventually, after laying there for maybe an hour, I open up my phone and I look at the old photos of my life, thinking about how messed up it was that it got to this point and how I lost everything. The noises were still happening this entire time, but I paid no mind to it. Eventually, for whatever reason, I get up and I go to sit down on the back porch because I just couldn't sleep. I make my way downstairs and out the back door to the porch. I'm messing around on my phone for maybe five minutes when it happens. I see movement to my left from the back door I just exited from. I glance over and time itself freezes. At first, I think that it's an illusion, but I was in fact wrong. I see a man shrouded in darkness peering past the wall inside to gaze at me. His lower half of his figure was behind the wall entirely, and I could not see anything but his upper body. The rest of his body was leaning to the left, peeking behind this wall, almost like the man was trying not to let me see his full body, as it would make his presence known. The man was a pure black silhouette, and I could not make out any features. After noticing him, I just sat there and stared at him for what seemed like forever, but it was probably only a minute or two. I expected him to come outside and talk to me, because I normally talk to a lot of homeless people, and I thought the man was just homeless. He didn't come outside though, he had not moved at all actually. He was as still as a statue, quiet as a mouse, maybe if I had not noticed him. He would have stared at me the entire time. After staring at him for a bit, I got up and got my bicycle and made my way off of the property. As I'm walking out of the backyard, I peer into the window that's next to the door I saw the man in. The moonlight revealed the man was still there. Only now he was watching me walk off of the property. I could tell because the moonlight revealed the top of the man's head and I saw his left eye gazing at me. He was a white male who was very tall and had a jacket of some kind on. I couldn't make out any more details because he was cloaked in darkness. After seeing this, I just move a little faster to get out of there. I get to the front of the house on the street and I looked inside to see if I could see him again. I 
could not. I got on my bicycle and waved goodbye to the house because I figured the man was still watching me. I then rode on. For the rest of that night, I couldn't sleep. I tried two different spots, but both were no luck. This is where the story ends. I know I didn't have any crazy chase or fight to the death or anything, but this was real life, and it's not the same as movies or books. I don't know what the man was doing in there. I assume he was trying to sleep like I was, but the way he was staring at me was very unnerving. It makes me wonder how long the man was in the house for, and what would have happened if I actually fell asleep in there. Would he have stared at me while I was asleep, completely blind to his presence? Or did he have other intentions? I will never know, but now I don't go into houses like that anymore at all, after this experience. So, to the man shrouded in darkness, let's not meet again. Recently, I've been getting more into cosplaying and going to conventions. I've been making all my own clothes for a while now, but only recently decided to really start getting into it. I've been to a handful of conventions over the year, and this is the first bad experience I've had. Anyway, for this convention, I wore my Supergirl cosplay. I made and patterned it myself, and overall, I was pretty happy with how it came out. A handful of people asked me for pictures, and generally I said yes. Well, later into the convention, my friends left, but I was going to meet up with some other friends later that night. So I took a break from walking around and sat in one of the hallways where there was a small seating area. Someone walked up to me and asked me for a picture. I said sure and stood up to pose. He then said, entirely unprompted, Thank you for being one of the few cosplayers that actually has the physique to pull off that cosplay. I said, excuse me, and decided I no longer wanted to take a picture with him. So while he rambled and tried to backpedal, I picked up my bag and just started to walk away. He then proceeded to grab me and physically try and block me from leaving. I shoved him off, shouting, do not touch me and walked away. He was shouting after me. I wasn't paying attention to what he was saying. I just told him not to touch me again and walked off. I didn't get the chance to report him then since I just wanted to get away as quickly as possible. But about 15 minutes later, I was on my way to meet with the other friends I mentioned previously, and I saw him again. Of course I immediately made a beeline for the nearest staff member so I could report him. I looked over my shoulder, and he was doing that ominous Kubrick stare, very much giving, I think I'm an edgy anime protagonist vibes. I explain what happened to a staff member. He starts walking towards me. When I finish telling the story, he's standing about five feet from me and starts saying, what I meant was that most cosplayers are overweight, and I cut him off and walked away because my friends were waiting for me. Like, dude, I know that was what you meant the first time. That's why I thought you were an asshole. And that his first reaction was to try and defend himself again and not profusely apologize for grabbing me when I was trying to get away from him. Anyway, later that night, I followed up with Connops. They told me they talked to him and it put him on watch lists and said, I'm not saying this is an excuse, but he explained that he was autistic and didn't actually mean harm. I said that the harm was still done, and he made me feel incredibly unsafe, and the con ops person said she would work on getting him banned from the weekend, but not the convention as a whole. I only went to that convention on Friday, since I had to work Saturday and Sunday, so I'm not sure if anything happened after that. This was about four or five years ago. 
Back then, I lived with my mother in a shed on a farm surrounded by woodland. Our farmland was a part of a larger piece of farmland that was split up and sold off, so we did have neighbors, though they were roughly half a kilometer away each. We loved that because of the privacy. It wasn't like there was nobody nearby I could go to if I needed help. That thought is what had me fearlessly walking alone at night between the hours of 7 to 8 p.m., sometimes fluctuating from earlier to later depending on the day. Sometimes I even went out on a walk at 2 a.m. in the morning because I was restless and couldn't sleep. Looking back, this was incredibly stupid, and after this incident, I never walked after 6 p.m. ever again, always making sure there was at least some sunlight left when I set out. The route I always took was a road circuit. The first part was out in the open in front of all the other farms, including my own. If anything had happened, at least one person would have noticed, and reception was pretty good, so I would have also been able to call someone. The second half, on the other hand, was concealed by about 200 meters of woods between the farms and the back road, stretching the full two kilometers at the back of the farm, and it was during that part of the walk when I had this creepy encounter. It was late at night. I can't remember what time exactly, but it was pitch black with the exception of my torchlight. I was about to approach the turn in the loop that would bring me out into the open again when I heard it. Help. It was this monotone voice that repeatedly asked for help. It didn't seem panicked in the least. I took my earphones out and turned my music off to make sure I was hearing correctly, but it didn't stop. Help. Help. A very stupid part of me almost responded, because for some reason, my first instinct was, Oh no, someone's in trouble. Like a naive kid, even though I would have been like 16 or 17 at the time. Of course, then my brain kicked in, and I realized that approaching that voice was just about the stupidest thing I could do. So I started quietly backing away. Unfortunately, my cat had followed me on the walk, and wasn't backing away with me. No, she was walking towards the voice, softly hissing. I remember desperately trying to get her to come back towards me without alerting the voice to my presence, just in case they hadn't noticed me yet. But I was getting scared and didn't want to stay there a moment more, so I ran forward and grabbed her. I then turned around and bolted back towards the house, I don't know if it was stupid of me to turn my back to the voice, as I was making so much noise while running that there was no way they didn't know I was there, and I had no way of knowing if they were giving chase. I was so fucking terrified that whole time. The image of someone cloaked in shadows chasing me entered my mind, and even though I couldn't hear anyone behind me, I never once slowed down until I was back safe and sound within my house. It doesn't end there, though. Despite how terrifying it was, there was still a part of me that was concerned about whoever it was, because what if they really had needed help? So I asked my mother to drive us to the location. Another very stupid decision, considering what we found. That being nothing. We called out and called out, but nobody answered. We didn't get out of our car, though. Luckily, neither of us were that stupid. We drove home, having seen nothing and no one. But it still bothered me in the morning, so I had my mother drive us over again, and we searched the immediate area. Nothing. No indication that anyone had been there. There was no body, which admittedly was a drastic thing to search for. But I know shock can leave you eerily calm which could have explained the voice and the lack of response afterwards, and that made me fear we'd been too late and we'd find a body in the morning. I don't know if I would have preferred this outcome, because at least then I would have had a face to the voice. But no, we found absolutely nothing, and to this day, I have no idea who that voice belonged to and why they were monotonously calling out for help. My mind has naturally come to some chilling conclusions and theories, 
that leave me unable to sleep. Kidnappers, serial killers, all the classic horror stories. But I guess I'll never really know for sure. I, a mid-twenties woman, was traveling solo through Europe for the month of March. I had the most incredible time and overall felt extremely safe. There was just one encounter that felt so bizarre and honestly scary. It was around 10 a.m. in a mid-sized city in Germany on a Sunday. I just checked out of my hotel and was walking through the city center with my backpack on my way to the train station. Lots of people around waiting for the tram and walking, a really safe area. I noticed a woman standing in the middle of the street where the tram tracks were. She was wearing a backpack on her front, but not like a traveler's backpack, a smaller one. She looked maybe early 40s, wasn't disheveled, looked clean, was dressed appropriately for the weather, that kind of thing. Soon after I passed her, I heard her calling out in German and soon realized she was calling out to me. She was clearly not in distress or asking for help. She wanted to make conversation, and with many folks, I'd totally be down for that. But something about this person was instantly not sitting right with me. I ignored her at first, but she would not stop. So as I kept walking, I said, Sorry, I don't speak German. In hindsight, this was stupid, and later in my trip, I wouldn't have done it but I was still getting used to all of this. Oh, you want to speak American? She said. We can speak American. I ignored her, but soon became aware that she'd started following me. I picked up my pace and ducked into a crowded bakery, thinking either she wouldn't see, or at least I'd be around other people in a contained space. I ordered, but before I even sat, I saw her come in and order something too. I was pretty freaked out at this point. I sat down and put in my earbuds and opened a book, not actually listening to or reading anything, but hoping it would keep her from talking to me. No. She came over and sat at my table. I tried to ignore her, but again she was relentless, waving at me and smiling. I don't even know how to describe her smile. It was like, just really forced and unnatural like she was putting on some kind of act. I asked what she needed, and she told me that she'd seen me walking and thought I looked like I needed some compassion. I told her no, I was good, everything was fine, but thanks, trying to be as appeasing as possible while still making my disinterest clear. She kept smiling at me and asked if I had money and a place to stay. I told her yes, I was fine. She started talking about various things, people she'd met on trains, dance classes, whatever else. Her English was not great, so I didn't really understand a lot of it, but suffice it to say, these were all completely random topics. The really strange thing, though, is that I didn't get the impression that she had a mental illness or any kind of neurodivergence that would explain a conversation like this. It felt like she was just trying to think of ways to just keep talking to me. Like, at times, I could see the wheels turning in her head as she tried to come up with something, anything else to say. This went on for probably five minutes. Finally, she offered to move to her own table. I said yes, that would be great if she could. She sat at the closest one to me, but even then tried to get my attention and talk to me. She finally sort of stopped, but still kept looking back at me and pulling out her smartphone to text someone. Also, she never once touched the massive slice of cake that she'd bought at this bakery. There was one man, a fellow customer, sitting nearby who looked sympathetic to me and kept glancing over like he was suspicious of this woman and what was going on. But I don't think he spoke English, so he couldn't really understand and it's not like I could have explained it to him as I don't speak German. My heart was racing. Finally, I decided I needed to get out of there. I kept checking Google Maps to see when the next tram would arrive, 
there was a stop almost right outside. And once it was just a minute away, I slipped out of the bakery while the woman was looking down at her phone and ran onto the tram. I watched the doors the whole time to make sure she didn't follow me and didn't stop looking behind me until I was safe at the train station. I haven't been able to stop thinking about this, and I don't know what to make of it. I met tons of outgoing people in Europe, people much more direct and sociable than Americans, but no one else ever made me feel the way this woman did. Something about the whole situation, following me, buying something that she never ate just so she could come into the bakery, looking back at me and texting someone. It just felt so off. I believe I have pretty good instincts when it comes to people, and this person just didn't feel right from the beginning. I can't help but be afraid that she saw me with my backpack, quite obviously a tourist, and was planning on doing something to this naive and vulnerable American. I guess I'll never know, but I'm curious to hear if any of you have ideas, or if I'm just totally misreading a harmless situation. Thanks for listening. So there were these two guys that came into my work. It was normal until my coworker pointed out that these two guys were staring at me very intensely. They were non-stop staring and even turning their heads to stare. They weren't even hiding it at all. The stare was very predatory-like and made me feel extremely uncomfortable. It was like they were watching my every move. Every time I would look in their direction, they would be staring at me. For context, I work at a restaurant and we have bottomless drinks. They ordered food and had eaten it, but kept on refilling their drinks, staying at the table for at least four hours which is highly unusual, as customers will typically spend 45 minutes on average or less, as we are sort of like a fast food restaurant. One guy was on his computer, the other was on his phone sometimes, but the majority of the time, they were just staring. They were barely talking to each other and were mostly silent. One of the guys left at some point, but the other one was still there until I had to clock out. The guy also asked me a few questions when he asked me for ice cream. That being, where I'm from, because apparently I looked foreign to him, and he asked if I came from Spain. It was pretty unusual. When I left the restaurant and I turned around, the guy was right behind me. I panicked and stopped. The guy walked past me, and I walked in the opposite direction. I called my mom and got home safe. I'm nervous about this, and I'm feeling very uncomfortable. Although nothing happened, I'm worried that I'll see them again. My gut feeling is telling me they had bad intentions. My dad's house is haunted as fuck and I moved out when I was 15. One night I was visiting, my dad was asleep upstairs and my brother and I were playing games. We hear a light knock at the door. I went to go answer it and my brother told me not to. I figured it was a friend he didn't want to see. The knocking got louder and went from the door to all the windows around the house. Just intense banging. I asked him who it was. He said it was our mom, and that freaked me out, but the cameras outside were showing nothing. Thirty minutes this went on, and it got so intense you could see the glass and doors shake. I ran outside, and then it stopped. That's not necessarily the creepiest, but it's one of the shorter stories. Taps comes to my dad's house every six months, and I haven't been there past dark in about ten years. A few years ago, a new hiking buddy climbed up a waterfall. 
He slipped on some pine needles at the top and fell 40 feet down onto rock. I was the first person there. There was blood pouring out of his head. He had a broken spine. His shin broke through the skin. He bit below his mouth and pretty much had a second one. It took an hour or two for medics to get to us, and another two hours to use ropes to lift him out of the valley to a helicopter. Miraculously, he was out of the hospital after a few months, and eventually regained full movement. All medical experts were shocked that he made a full recovery. It was the most traumatic event of my life by far. I used to walk my grandparents' dog when I visited, since they were too old to walk her for very long. Most of our walks were through the woods. The dog's name was Molly. So, Molly and I would always go for a long walk, maybe an hour or so. There was one clearing that I liked to visit deep in the woods since it had a lot of branching paths, and the clearing had moss that was firm enough to comfortably take a rest on. Anyway. We went down one of the less worn trails one evening. I remember it leading to a lot of pine trees, small hills, and a rubble pile near the end that served as a landmark. At some point, we must have taken a wrong turn since I didn't know where we were, and normally we would have passed the rubble heap by then. I stopped for a minute and looked around to figure out what to do next. The sun was low in the sky. There were pine trees as far as I could see, and it was quiet, too quiet. It occurred to me that the woods were never quiet, since it was in a neighborhood and there was always an animal or two walking around. It was summer, so there would have been at least one bird around. Being a lake town, there was also usually wind. After realizing that it was oddly quiet, I'd also realized that it felt like I was being watched. Being an underdeveloped 11-year-old, I didn't like that. To further my suspicion, Molly started to tug on her leash back the way we came. She never did that. Listening to my gut, I checked ahead of the trail one more time before going back the way I came, occasionally looking back. After a certain point, I started to hear rustling that wasn't coming from Molly and I, at which point we started running. I didn't stop running until we reached the clearing again, and the rustling stopped, too. I could hear the birds again, and the wind was also blowing. Molly and I walked back to the house at a normal pace, and everything was normal after that. On subsequent trips, I take that trail off the beaten path with family, in the hopes of figuring out how I got lost that day. But it was always a straight shot over hills and through the trees to the rubble pile. So a few years ago, I was on vacation in California for Disneyland. It was my girlfriend and I's follow-up vacation after the pandemic stopped us traveling in 2020. We had also brought along her younger sister with her high school friend. Now here's the thing. We all had lost someone in 2020. I lost my mother to untreated diabetic complications that she never recovered from. My girlfriend and her sister lost their grandmother after Thanksgiving due to a heart attack. And the friend who came along had her father pass as well from a long fight with cancer. With this in mind, I can tell you something touching yet paranormal. It was our last night and we'd come from Grand Central Market in downtown LA. Now, during the trip, my roommates back home had asked me to bring back one thing only, California weed from a dispensary, definitely cheaper than back home. So while we were finishing our meal at GCM, the girls had agreed to go out of the way and visit a shop. A quick Google search showed one not too far from us, at most a 10 minute drive through side streets. What we didn't know was that these side streets were through some empty homeless camps under bridges and a boarded up industrial section with no street lights on. Mind you, we're in a rental minivan 
so obviously we stood out as tourists. While following the GPS voice to the dispensary, we started talking about our dead relatives. All of them had lived in downtown LA during the 80s and 90s, so that's how the topic came up. My girlfriend's sister mentioned how unsafe the area looked, and we all agreed. The next thing we know, the GPS voice comes on and says, With me at your side, you will always be safe. We all went quiet at that moment, and the GPS had beeped and was redirecting our route. It made us take two or three turns, and suddenly we were back on a well-lit street with lots of people around. LA is like that. Cross a block or two, and you go from skid row to restaurants and shops. And this was my phone. I'd been using Google GPS as far back as 2012, and never once have I heard it say something anything like that. I still think about it. My girlfriend thinks it was the mentioning of them that made the GPS say that. I still think about that moment. It wasn't scary, but definitely wasn't something normal, given the circumstances. So let me start out by saying that I enjoy writing, though this is non-fiction, but it hopefully will be an interesting read. I also admit that I have absolutely no memory of this experience. I was a little over two years old and just starting to walk on my own when this event took place. My mom only told me this story around three years ago when I was 32 and about to get married. My mother was raised in a very tiny fundamentalist Christian community and had no belief in the paranormal. She believed that our souls sleep until Judgment Day or something like this. Ergo, there are no ghosts or spirits to haunt houses. Even over 30 years later, she still sounded terrified as she told me this. This woman, who always talks way too loud, was literally whispering by the end of it, and she was white as a sheet. I believed her completely and still do. I'm just glad I can't remember it too. In 1988, my parents had their second child. This was my brother, Victor. We were very crowded in our rented flat with two babies. My parents decided to move to a rambling old two-story farmhouse on a seven-acre plot in southern Ohio for more room for the family. It was way out in the sticks and took almost an hour to get to town from there. My mom said that the first time I saw the house, I freaked out. I was crying and saying things like, Don't like that mean house. Mean house. Ugly house. Don't like. Scary house mama. Don't like. My mom says this behavior was very out of character for me, but I stopped complaining about the house after a few weeks, so she chalked it up to the stress of the move. Now, this house was ramshackle as fuck, and in the middle of nowhere. The kitchen was to the far rear of the house, and until recently, before we moved in, still had a working, ancient wood-burning cooking stove against the back wall. This had caught the back wall on fire a couple of months before we moved in, and caused a lot of damage. A lot of this damage wasn't fixed, so my young, broke parents got a cheap rent agreement. Gotta love the 80s. On the second floor, directly above the kitchen, was a locked room. The landlord claimed it had heavy fire damage, but her son, who had done the repairs, claimed that the only fire damage left was in the kitchen, since it had been the worst and was beyond his skill level to fix. Either way, the landlord was adamant that the room was off limits, and my parents always respected that. I would have looked a hundred percent. I know all this because I heard stories about the shitty farmhouse with the creepy door my whole life, and there were pictures of us in and around the farmhouse. The locked door was right next to the upstairs landing, so there was no avoiding it, and both of my parents had told me it gave them the creeps. A few months after we moved in, my mother and I were in the yard with our pit Doberman mix, Boss. She was hanging laundry and I was rolling around with the dog. She said that just as she noticed that everything was way too silent, 
bus started going apeshit from surprisingly far away. About 500 yards to the house on the left, there was a small duck pond. Boss was in between the two, running towards my mom, then turning and running back towards the pond, barking frantically the whole time. My mom saw something thrashing around in the middle of the pond. She took off towards the water full speed. Boss beat her there and drug me out of the water himself. Although my mom was confused how I got so far so fast and how I got into the center of the pond since it was over my head and I couldn't swim, she figured she underestimated me and brought in the baby gates and play pens. I was to be contained from now on. A few weeks later, she was cooking downstairs. Boss was outside, Victor asleep in his crib, and I was in my playpen in my room upstairs. I also had a gate on my door and one at the top of the stairs. The stairs ran up from the side of the kitchen, so my mom said she could listen for us crying or fussing while cooking. My mom said that no longer than 15 minutes after the last time she looked in on us kids, Boss starts going crazy again in the yard. She runs up to check on us. Victor is sleeping. Every baby gate is still shut and locked, but I am not in my room. A frenzied search reveals I'm not in the house at all. A sudden image of Boss saving me from drowning causes my mom to rush outside to see what the hell he's trying to tell her this time. She said he was running circles in the yard, barking uncontrollably. When she got outside, he took off towards the right, away from the pond. He would run ahead, turn around, and bark at my mother, wait for her to catch up a bit before racing off again. He ended up leading her almost a mile and a half out onto the dirt road that separated our property from our neighbors. He led her to a thick stand of trees on our neighbor's side of the rocky drive. She said what hit her first was the foul stench of advanced decay. She plowed into the trees with her heart in her throat and her stomach full of ice. She said she noticed many piles of corrugated tin, tarps, tires, and other debris. The miasma was emanating most strongly from these junkyard cairns. Peeking under a sheet of tin, she discovered the extremely decomposed corpse of a butchered cow. As she headed deeper into the thicket, where the tree cover was denser, she said less care was taken to cover the remains. Grisly pieces of bones and rotted chunks of bovine littered the area. Apparently our neighbor, in an effort to cheat his taxes, had been illegally slaughtering the cattle and hiding the remains in at least one of the few thick stands of trees around. She found me in the dead center of this thicket, just standing there looking around like I was confused, surrounded by carnage. She said I didn't seem scared or anything, just standing. She rushed over to me and, after ascertaining that I wasn't injured, began questioning me on why I was here, how I got there, and other questions like that. Keep in mind that although my mother said I started speaking very young, I still didn't have much of a vocabulary. She said I told her, with that serious look only a small child can give, that the children brought me here, shitting her pants at the thought that anyone, even children, could walk right past her through the kitchen get me from upstairs and walk right past her on the way down the stairs and out with me. She demanded to know what children and where the hell they are now. I looked at her dead serious and told her the ones that live with us in the room at the top of the stairs and that I didn't see them anymore. After a moment of stunned silence, she started asking all kinds of questions about these children However, she told me that I refused to say anything else. She said, as long as she questioned me about what happened, I would just stand there staring at her with a serious expression and my mouth closed. She said this same pattern held true every other time she brought it up to me, so she was always left wondering and immediately began hounding my dad about moving closer to town. 
While the incident with me getting to the pond was highly unlikely, it was at least remotely possible. My mother is adamant that me being in the hidden slaughter yard that day was flat impossible. She says there's no way I could have even known it was out there, much less have the ability to open and relock the baby gates, get downstairs, past her, and end up almost two miles down the road and in this place in under 15 minutes. I was only two and as slow and clumsy as most toddlers. As I said, she's still shaken by it after 30 years. Personally, I have no idea what happened that day. I've thought about hypnosis, but haven't yet decided I really want to remember. Maybe it's better to let it be a mystery, because whatever the fuck those things were, I really don't think they were children. In early 2016, I moved to a city in New Jersey that from which New York City is very accessible via the PATH train. I am a professional studio musician, and I was seeking better gigs than I had in the previous American city I lived in, a much smaller city with less opportunities. While living in the previous city, I had befriended another professional musician and worked with her on various projects until she moved to New Jersey six months previous to me. So when I made my own move, it made sense that her and I would be roommates. We had become best friends through our work together and were pretty much constantly hanging out. She will be hereafter known as best friend. In the intervening time while I wasn't there yet, she reconnected with her on-again, off-again boyfriend, known hereafter as asshole boyfriend and he had moved in, so I was going to be living with both of them. Great, I honestly thought. My rent will be cheaper, and there will be less temptation between me and my best friend. I was in a long-term relationship of almost a decade, but given my closeness to my best friend, I was always on guard for feelings. At first, things were fine. Her asshole boyfriend and I even chilled a few times, I'm more of a drinker and he's more of a smoker, which is no big deal. But over the next few months, he began to smoke way too much and it was having deleterious effects on his life and personality. Eventually, all he had time for was work, video games, and to scream the most vile, torturous things at my best friend at three in the morning, every night. It got to the point after the cops had been called a few times, where my best friend would stay out with work friends all night rather than come home. I talked to her asshole boyfriend, one of those man-to-man -man movie moments, and he seemed to understand what an unrelenting shit stain he was being. I was concerned for my best friend, and their fights prevented anything like a normal semblance of a sleep schedule. My best friend and I became extremely close as a result of the psychological abuse he was, by six months in, heaping on both of us. But gaslighting is a powerful tool, and both of us felt extremely helpless. Our lives were being dictated by a psycho stoner who had developed trust issues due to the closeness he was creating between me and his girlfriend. Despite this, she was loyal and neither of us ever made a pass at each other. My best friend and I took a really good show off her in another state, and we were gone for a few days, which led to his paranoia bubbling over. On the drive back to New Jersey, my best friend told me she'd made the decision to leave the relationship for good. I told her I generally thought that was wise. She didn't break up with him right away, I had a business trip to Boston about three days later, and I came back the next day. That night, my best friend and I stayed up too late drinking and talking about my trip, and she ended up passing out hard on the couch in the living room. I put a pillow under her head and draped a throw blanket over her fully clothed body. Little did I know that this gesture of kindness to a friend was, in her asshole boyfriend's mind, 
an ultimate betrayal. The next morning, he pounded loudly on my bedroom door, telling me to get out of my room so he could kick my ass. I'm six foot one and 190 pounds. He's like five foot six and 140. I was exhausted from my trip, so I told him to fuck off. He went to work, and when I told my best friend that he'd threatened me with violence, she got pissed. She broke up with him through text. I know that's not the classiest move, but this guy was deranged. I believe she was concerned about what he might do in person, and I supported the idea. My parents were visiting me for sightseeing in New York City and had a hotel for the night in Jersey. I explained the situation to my mom, and I asked if my best friend and I could crash at their hotel room, as we were both terrified of his tone through text. My mom came in her car to pick us up. As my best friend packed her things, my mom was in the living room playing our piano. The asshole boyfriend apparently left work early in a rage, and came the whole way back from the Bronx just to barge in. He screamed, he made threats, he spit in my mom's face. I stood up and got in his face, and he ran into my best friend's room and, locking the door behind him, proceeded to break all of her shit. A $200 makeup palette, all her perfume and jewelry, and an irreplaceable porcelain piece that had belonged to her mother. A mother who passed away when she was a toddler. I tell my mom to get out now, leading her into the atrium of our apartment building to the stairs. Call the cops, I managed out before running back into the apartment because I'm not leaving my best friend alone with him. When I get back, the situation has gone to shit. He's now standing in the living room with the kitchen knife to his throat, saying that she was the love of his life, and if she doesn't take him back, he's going to end it, even intimating that the cops wouldn't believe it was self-inflicted, and I would go to jail for his murder. Right. I try to talk him down and take a step forward, to which he holds the knife against my face and says he should cut my face so I'm not attractive to his girlfriend anymore, or something crazy like that. It was scary, but it mostly just pissed me off. This whole time, I'm looking for a time to jump in, but my best friend is standing way too close to him, and I don't want that knife ending up anywhere near her. My best friend is pissed that he had threatened me, so she gave him a Floyd Mayweather right hook to his face. So now he's still standing, still screaming about ending himself and bleeding profusely from his lip. I've never been more proud of my best friend. After forcing us to sit on the couch while he rants for about 20 minutes, we hear a knock on the door. It's the police. He doesn't drop the knife right away and their weapons are almost drawn. It's a whole thing. They take him away for a medical exam. My best friend did not want to press charges. Trauma and abuse can be a bitch when it comes to things like that, and I wanted to give her my support, so neither did I. The next day, I got a temp restraining order until the court date could be set. This guy manages to never get served, so that temp RO is still very much in effect in New Jersey. I'm told that even had we pressed charges, there wasn't a ton of evidence, as he was really good about never saying anything overly threatening through text. In the next few months, suffering from reoccurring nightmares and the like, my best friend and I fall in love amidst the complete breakdown of my previous relationship. We didn't announce our togetherness publicly, i.e. Facebook, for four months. When we do, he sees it through a spam account he's made and hacked his now ex-girlfriend's Instagram deleting about a thousand photos of her high school memories that she doesn't have backed up, and replacing them with violent images. She loses about a thousand followers in a day. This is when I decide to get revenge. I tell his entire family what he did, and they don't care. They believe me, and don't care. He's texting my best friend terrible things, and she says, 
I'm just going to block him, and my full revenge mind kicks in. I say, no, don't block him, amp him up. She starts telling him intimate details about everything. How much happier she is, the sex is better, basically everything an ex doesn't want to hear. He says, why are you telling me this? You're being so cruel. And my best friend says, well, it was pretty cruel when you threatened to hurt Chris and I with a knife. He replies, I only threatened to cut Chris, not you. Cha-ching. Now we have evidence. That's the last we heard from him. We live in New York City proper now. So I guess you could say that the text message is a pro-revenge in progress. It's in my back pocket and I'm saving it for the day that walking dumpster fire shows his face. But the real revenge is knowing that he knows through mutual acquaintances that my best friend and I are engaged to be married and very much in love. His worst nightmare became true because he couldn't keep his insecurities from driving us together. When I'm giving my wedding vows, I might just thank the asshole boyfriend Sometimes pro-revenge can be as simple as knowing that the happiest thing in your life is crushing your enemy. My friend and I went to our hostel in Poland and could not get the door open even though we had the code. These two men who claimed they were also staying there offered to help us but we could not get in until someone else came out of the building. At first, these guys were nice and helped us carry our luggage up the stairs to the hostel. Surprisingly, there was no one at the check-in desk, even though the owner specifically asked that we check in at this time. Because we already knew what room we were supposed to be in, the two guys helped show us to our room, and we all made pleasant introductions. They were 32 and 33 if I remember correctly, and we let them know our age, 21 and 23. They let us get settled, but we realized at this point that without being able to check in, we did not have keys to enter the building or even lock our door. Now here's where things got weird. We were already feeling a bit sketched out by the situation, as it was clear that the hostel was just a converted apartment but that's what you get for 10 euros a night, I guess. We then hear a brief knock on the door, and without waiting for a reply, these two guys come back into our room to talk, I think. The younger one of the two starts talking to us about going out that night and asking more questions about us, and at this point, my friend and I are exchanging looks. He mentions that he thinks I'm the one in charge because my friend looks young, and then proceeded to stroke his hand down her cheek. But wait, it gets better. He then reveals to us that he just did some cocaine and proceeded to offer us some, which we both adamantly declined. At this point, I just wanted him out of the room so we could have a chance to think, and this man did not want to leave. I finally backed him towards the door, but he wouldn't move his body so I could close it all the way and kept talking to us even though I was trying to gently shove him out. I finally got the door to close and then used my body to hold it shut. At this point my friend had tried to call the owner multiple times to no avail, so we decided to book another hostel and leave. We waited until we heard the guys leave and booked it out of there to our new hostel and are in the process of getting a refund since we booked and paid the fee online. So, creepy hostile men, let's please never, ever meet again. Jefferson National Forest lies just north of Blacksburg, Virginia. My absolute favorite part of the forest is Pandapus Pond. The pond itself is scenic and beautiful, but the best part are the miles and miles of hiking trails accessible from the pond. I try to hike between three to six miles per week. 
I do this for two reasons. Firstly, because it's great exercise, and secondly, because it helps keep me sane. Today, however, the sanity part changed. Today, just like I do every week, I packed a few bottles of water and a collapsible water bowl for my dog, Lana, and headed for the pond. When I parked, I noted six or seven cars in the parking lot and thought about how I'd for sure need to keep Lana close to me so we wouldn't bother any of the other hikers or pond goers. I always turn on a hiking app on my phone, and as soon as I get out of the car, the app helps me gauge the distance I've hiked, and most importantly, it helps ensure I don't get lost. For any of you that may have knowledge of the area, you know it's borderline impossible to get lost on these trails, but I like to have the security. I got out of the car, shouldered my bag, grabbed the dog leash, and turned on the app. I was greeted with the familiar, start workout, and I began walking towards the pond. Everything seemed perfect. The temperature was cool, the sky was overcast, and for the first half mile, I was completely alone. As Lana and I rounded a bend, we saw another hiker. This hiker was a man in his early to mid-twenties, and he was moving. His eyes were wide and unblinking, and he looked nervous. He wasn't running, but I doubted I would have been able to keep up with him. Lana and I stepped to the side to let him pass, and I offered a friendly, good morning. This guy never stopped looking ahead. He never even acknowledged my existence. As he passed, I pulled out my phone to get a video of his odd behavior, and noticed I had absolutely no service. My hiking app's GPS showed me standing still on a blank map. My mile per minute tracker had skyrocketed to two hours per mile and was steadily climbing. I turned the app off to save battery and decided I would just stick to trails I already knew. When I finally reached the pond, it was a ghost town. Usually there are older couples and moms push jogging strollers around the pond loop, but today there wasn't a soul in sight. The combination of the deserted pond and the strange wide-eyed hiker was giving me an uneasy feeling, and for a moment, I considered turning around and heading home. As I was standing there, contemplating what to do next, I felt Lana pulling enthusiastically on her leash. Okay, okay, let's go, Lana Bear, I said as we moved forward. There's a section of the pond loop that forces you to cross a wooden bridge. The bridge separates the pond and a small section of marshland. Usually, when you cross it, you can hear bullfrogs bellowing and see ducks swimming around lazily. Today, though, there was nothing. No sound. No movement. Nothing. I found it a little unnerving. But as we were so close to the trailhead, I decided to push on. We took our usual route, Lady Slipper Trail to Joe Pie Trail to Poverty Creek Trail. Usually once we hit Poverty Creek Trail, we take a right and head back to the car. But today was such perfect hiking weather that I decided to take a left and try a new trail I'd never been on before. I double-checked my location on a posted trail map and decided I would follow Poverty Creek to Royale Trail then loop back towards the parking lot about halfway down Royale. As soon as I turned left on Poverty Creek, I experienced the worst case of vertigo I've ever experienced. I leaned on a low-hanging branch for a few minutes, trying to regain my composure. When I finally felt normal again, I decided to snap off that branch and use it as a walking stick, just in case the vertigo came back. The branch gave me a ton of resistance before finally coming off. However, it didn't make a sound. I stopped and stared at the branch that should have come off with an ear-shattering crack and realized I couldn't hear anything other than my own breath. I looked up at the sky, barely visible through the canopy of the trees. The sky was a lot darker than when I first stepped onto the trail. 
I felt my heart start racing. Calm down. It just looks like it's gonna rain. That's why you don't hear any animals. I thought to myself. For some stupid reason, I decided to keep going. I could have, and most definitely should have, turned around. But I kept going and turned onto Royale Trail. After about 15 minutes of walking and hearing only the sound of Lana panting, I figured I should be close to the point where I could loop back around and get out of the woods. Another minute or two of walking presented me with a trail that headed in the general direction I needed to go. This trail was unmarked, unlike all the other trails. Whatever, just get out of these woods before you get stuck out here in the rain. This I said out loud, mostly just to break the silence. This unmarked trail looked pretty well traveled, so I assumed I was okay. I assumed so very wrong. The trail quickly narrowed to nothing more than a deer trail, but as it was going the way I needed to go, I decided to follow it. The vegetation started to get really thick, and I had to duck my head so I didn't get hit in the face by stray branches. Barreling through the brush like I was should have been loud enough to wake the dead, but instead, I heard nothing but my own heavy breathing. Suddenly, I fell through the brush and into a clearing. On my hands and knees, I started to laugh at how shitty this hike was going and looked over at Lana. She was frozen in place. All of her hair was raised and her teeth were bared. She looked straight ahead and let out a low growl. I slowly looked up hoping it was just a deer or a rabbit. Instead, I saw something that made my blood run cold. In the center of the clearing stood a man clad in camouflage. He was facing away from me with his head down. Lana growled again, and I saw the man's head perk up. Run, he said in a low, gruff voice. I ran faster than I thought my feet could carry me, little Lana somehow matching my stride. As I silently crashed through the brush, I turned to see if the man was following us. He was. He wasn't running, but he still seemed to be gaining on me. Every time I looked over my shoulder, he was a little closer. I couldn't see his eyes, but he flashed an unnerving white smile as he gained on us. I knew I had to be close to 460, the highway that runs through the forest, and I knew if I could just make it to the pavement that I'd have a chance of making it home. Run, little piggy, the man taunted just behind me. I saw the highway and changed direction. My legs screamed for me to stop, and every breath I took felt like broken glass was filling my lungs. I dove through the tree line and heard the man laugh as I crash landed on the shoulder of 460. I scrambled to my feet and turned around, just in time to see the man melt back into the woods. The last part of him I saw was that white smile. As that too disappeared, the silence I'd been in for the better part of an hour stopped. The sound of passing cars and semi-trucks suddenly blasted me, and I realized I was safe. I looked around and got my bearings, and realized I was still at least two miles from my car. I started walking back towards the parking lot, making sure to keep ample distance between myself and the tree line. During breaks in the cars passing, I could hear twigs snapping and couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. I finally made it back to my car. I was shaking so bad, I dropped my keys twice trying to unlock the door. As I was closing my car door, I heard the man's eerie taunt again. Run, little piggy. I've come to the decision that I will never hike there again.
My mom's home that I grew up in has always been haunted. Every day and night, there's very loud footsteps and occasionally something more spooky would happen, like hearing voices and stuff like that. I'm not the only one who's experienced these things. My mom, dad, boyfriend, and even friends have all heard some weird stuff. But there is one thing in particular that would terrify me the most. Almost every night when I lay in bed, I would feel this gut-dropping, heart-pounding fear and think that I was just being ridiculous and afraid of the dark. But I could swear that I saw a young girl in my room in the shadows, usually under my bed. She had dark hair, pale skin, and big, wide, black eyes. I would be almost hyperventilating under my covers, peeking out at her through my tiny breathing hole. I would lay there, paralyzed in fear, until I either eventually made a mad dash to my mom's bedroom, or inevitably fell asleep in my own bed. I couldn't work out if she was actually there, or if it was just me being afraid of our creepy house and imagining things. I thought this because nobody else ever saw her but me. The years went by, and these nightly episodes continued. I felt like I was being terrorized by this girl, but all she ever did was stare at me. My bed was right next to a mirrored cupboard, so I could see her laying under there, literally inches away from me. It still makes my skin crawl thinking about that. Anyway, it somehow got even worse as time went by. I swear that she always seemed to be the same age as me. When I was small, so was she. When I was 12 and a bit taller, so was she. I got more and more scared of her realizing this, and when I was about 15, I basically never slept alone at my mom's anymore. I was always visiting my dad, staying with friends, or having them over. I eventually forgot about the creepy girl and decided that she mustn't be real. After all, there were other ghosts here that other people saw, but nobody ever mentioned her. I also did have a very bad fear of the dark as a kid, so that must be it, right? I even started sleeping alone in my room again after a while. That creepy feeling always remained, but I just refused to look in that mirror at night ever again. Now, fast forward to now that I'm in my early 20s. Life is good. I live in my own place that's not haunted. But unfortunately, it doesn't end here. My mom called me in the morning, as she usually does to say hi, but she sounded a bit off. She said, You're gonna want to hear this. Something happened to Steve last night that was really creepy. Steve is her boyfriend. To cut the long story short, Steve isn't a ghost believer and has always tried to ignore the very obvious sounds at night. I think it creeped him out too. Well, this night, him and my mom were watching TV on the couch when the footsteps were much louder than ever before. Steve tried to tell my mom that someone was upstairs in her house and she laughed it off saying, Oh, it's just the ghosts. I've been telling you. They are real. Steve then went a bit quiet, probably trying to rationalize with himself that ghosts aren't real. Not long later, my mom went to bed, but Steve stayed up to watch more TV. After a while, the noises were too much for him, so he switched the lights off and went upstairs to bed. This is when shit got real. From the shadows of the now dark living room, Steve saw a shape begin to approach him. He climbed the stairs, going faster and faster as the figure gained on him. It was the girl. He could see her clearly now. She followed a few meters behind him all the way to my mom's bedroom. He was now basically running, and he shut the door firmly behind him, trying to escape to my mom's bed like I had many times as a kid. After Steve made it to the bed, the door cracked open, and the girl stuck her damn head in through the gap, looking straight at them for a long time before slowly leaving and closing the door again. 
I asked my mom, all my hairs now standing on end, how old was she? My mom then told me, Steve said she looked to be in her early 20s. My stomach dropped and tears began to form. So she is real, I whispered back. There was something very sinister feeling about this ghost. I think that's why I'm so creeped out and upset that it seems she was real. The other ghosts at Mom's are still creepy, but not evil feeling, like her. I live in a city in the Midwest and was hanging out at a friend's house one night. As I was leaving, it was dark. It was probably 10 or 11 at night. I'm a small woman and I look a lot younger than I am, so I have experienced quite a few creepy encounters sadly. This one still makes me nervous. I walk to my vehicle, which is parked right at the end of the sidewalk, and get in. I live about 4 minutes away and I'm kind of on autopilot. I never noticed anything, until this SUV behind me seems like they're making all the same turns. Sometimes I get paranoid that people are following me though, and I continue to drive home. I assume they'll turn at any moment, as they often do. Except, when I pull in my driveway, they pull across the end. They block me in. I'm terrified at this point so I call my husband and stay in my car. As he walks to the door, they notice and pull away. I still wonder why they followed me home and what would have happened if I was alone. I was home alone one night back in 2009 my parents were out on their weekly date nights. One of those had one too many at dinner and passed out in the movie theater kind of dates. Anyways, I just returned from my afternoon jog. Being a hot August day, I had worked up quite a sweat on my run, so I decided to take a cold shower and clean up a bit. My house doesn't have air conditioning and was quite stuffed up, so I decided to open a few windows to circulate the airflow within the house. I can remember opening a window in the kitchen, two windows across from each other in the living room, and one window in the basement. I knew I was going to be spending my evening down there watching movies since it was much cooler. I had my shower, got dressed, and went downstairs to make myself some dinner. I took my dinner down to the basement and flicked on Netflix to start my binge-filled night of new shows. I do not recall falling asleep, but I must have passed out not long after eating my food and laying down. When I woke up, it was dark outside. The only light being cast into the basement was from the dimly lit TV screen. It was now freezing in the basement. I could feel a cold breeze circulating the room from having the window open for too long. I got up and walked over to the light switch that was located at the bottom of the stairs. I closed the window then went back to turn off the TV, grab my dishes, and head upstairs. When I got upstairs, all the lights were off, indicating that my parents were still not home from their date. I cleaned the dishes, put them in the dishwasher, and closed the window above the sink. Just before I went to go up to my room for the night, I remembered that the windows in the living room were still open. I walked over to close the one window by the TV and over to the next, which was located by the front porch. I noticed that my mom's vase with fake flowers was knocked off the table in front of the window, and the flowers were sprawled out across the floor. I didn't think much of it at the time. Maybe there was a strong breeze and the curtains had tipped it over. I closed the window and started picking up the flowers. As I was cleaning, I heard a faint squeaky sound. What I can only imagine was a door handle being twisted. I listened as hard as possible. Following the creak of the handle was a creak in the hallway floor upstairs. A pain shot from my stomach to my chest and I froze. 
what seemed like an eternity of being bent over with my one hand holding the vase and the other clutching the flowers, I slowly stood up. I looked out the front window to check the driveway for my parents' car, hoping it was one of them upstairs. The driveway was empty. My heart sank. I quickly but quietly put the vase and flowers down on the table and silently began walking over to the bottom of the stairs to look up. As I got closer to the stairs, I heard two more creaks on the floor, which caused me to stop dead in my tracks. I waited, listening. Nothing. I was now only a few steps from the stairs. I took those last few steps and put one hand on the railing. I peeked around the corner and only saw darkness. I didn't know what to do. Do I flick on the lights and let the potential intruder in my house know that I'm coming upstairs? Do I leave and go to a friend's house? Do I call my parents? Do I grow a pair and just go upstairs? I decided to turn my phone on silent and go to the kitchen to text my dad, making sure I was close to the back door for an easy getaway. He said, it's an old house. It's just settling after a really hot day. I told him about the sound of the door handle twisting. He just assumed there was an open window upstairs and the wind was knocking a door against the frame. Was that it? Could it just be a window that was left open? I felt a huge chunk of my anxiety start to fade after talking with my dad. So I decided to grab a glass of water and head on up to bed. I flicked on the lights for the stairs and started making my way up. But slowly, a tiny knot in my stomach from before. I got to the top of the stairs and noticed that all of the doors were wide open, except for mine. My parents' room and a spare bedroom were on the left, and the den and my room were on the right, with the bathroom at the end of the hallway. Though as my dad had predicted, my door was cracked just enough that a breeze could be making it hit the door frame. It being as hot as it was today, it wasn't unusual for my mom to open all the doors and windows upstairs. I exhaled a sigh of relief, now fully confident that my dad was right. I turned on the lights to my room, did a quick look around, and walked over to my nightstand to put my water beside my laptop. Then I went to the bathroom to get ready for bed. As I lay in bed, trying to get sleepy, I was watching my favorite reruns of Seinfeld on my laptop. Then, out of nowhere, I heard the sound of something slowly scraping my closet door. I quickly flicked on the light beside my bed. My closet door was cracked open ever so slightly. Questions started racing through my head. Was it open the whole time? Was it closed when I came in? I was positive that it was closed when I came in. Before I even had time to rationalize my thoughts, I heard the most disturbing, creepy, quiet, sinister laugh I've ever heard in my life. No horror movie could ever replicate the sound I just heard. As soon as I slid the laptop off my legs, the closet door burst open and someone was standing in it. My clothes were partially covering their body and face. I looked closer and there was the most sickly, palest, dirtiest woman I've ever seen. For the split second that I saw her in horror, the image was burned into my brain forever. She had no shoes on her disgusting, dirt-stained feet. Her skin was sickeningly white with cuts and dried blood from her face, down her arms, all the way up to her legs. She was wearing what I assume used to be a white nightgown, was now a discolored mess of dirt, blood, and who knows what else. Her gray, blue-veined, sunken in face closely resembled a decaying skeleton. The rest of her face was hidden by my clothes. She asked in a quiet, grumbling, raspy voice, Have you seen my baby? That was enough for me to grab my phone and run. As soon as I was halfway out of my bedroom door, I heard her shriek, Give me back my baby. 
and clothes hangers thrashing around behind me, I ran as fast as I could to the upstairs bathroom and locked the door. It was only a second later that I heard a huge crash against the door, along with the woman screaming in a devilish tone, demanding I return her baby. I called 911 and the operator assured me the police would be there as fast as they could. I jammed my feet against the door and held my back against the sink, trying my hardest to make sure the door stayed closed. The woman would not let up though. Her shrieks turned into low, demon-like grunts, and her banging on the door turned into heavy bodily blows. With what seemed like an eternity, I heard a heavenly sound. I heard the police call out that they were entering the residence. I yelled at the top of my lungs that I was upstairs. All I could hear next was a mixed commotion of the officers yelling and the woman growling. The officers ended up pepper spraying the woman and it took three of them to be able to force her to the ground. She was yelling in a possessed like state the entire time. I did not come out of the bathroom until the cops assured me she was out of the house. The cops told me she was likely on drugs or an escaped mental patient from the next county over. I tried telling them that she sounded like she was possessed or something, but they chalked it up to the woman just needing her medication. My parents arrived home shortly after I gave my statement to the police. We moved out of that house a month later. That was one night I was home alone that sadly I will never forget. This took place in Colorado. This weed farm itself was way off the beaten path, which was perfect for growing a crop people liked to steal and made it interesting for the only security guard there at night. It was apparently used to grow beans throughout the 1900s before some bright-eyed entrepreneurs bought it to get a foot in the cannabis business. It's completely surrounded by woods on all sides. Upon entering the complex, you're met with several old farmhouses only one was used for offices, while the other two were just storage. This was called the admin area and is on the north end of the property. To the east, west, and south, you have three growing fields, all approximately 100 acres. Just past the admin area, you had seven greenhouses encompassed by a fence and a large garage attached to it that was used to house greenhouse supplies. Across the lot from that, another garage for farming equipment so a very large area for one lone security guard. Now, this was a brand new contract, so I had no one to show me around and was basically tasked with creating security procedure for the other guards to follow. To that end, I was working seven days a week, 4 p.m. to 6 a.m., until I had everything ironed out. My first day, I do a walkthrough of the place with my boss and the farm owner, then was left on my own to figure it out. Thankfully, I did have a decent little office in the admin building, and they even had an 8-channel security system set up. So weeks go by, and nothing weird has happened, not even an off feeling. If anything, it was beyond peaceful. I figured out a good security routine and made a policy out of it for new guards to follow. After that, life was easy. I do my checks, read fanfic, watch YouTube, glance at cameras, repeat. I was doing just that at about 2 a.m. when I see a black mass jump over the greenhouse fence. I bolt up, lock my office, and run down there, weapon drawn. Now that may seem like a dramatic response, but I should be the only person for literally miles around. The main road is the only way in by vehicle, and it's gated. Plus, the gate is right next to my office, so I would have seen or heard someone approach by vehicle and foot traffic at that hour and in that location. Well, it's probably not the mailman. I get to the greenhouse area gate and quietly let myself in. I start checking greenhouses one by one. After about 20 minutes, I find absolutely nothing. I find the camera in question 
and looked around the area, but I found nothing out of place. I end up doing my entire security check early just to be sure. I then head back to my office. I plan to review the footage because the fence is 8 foot tall with an additional foot of barbed wire across the top. That in itself freaks me out because I've been outside for over an hour before I realize the only thing that can clear that jump is a mountain lion. So I hustled back to my office, but my monitor is black. No signal found. The hard drive in the brand new DVR is fried. At this point it's weird, but not necessarily paranormal. A few days go by, we get the hard drive replaced and all is well. It's probably around midnight, and I'm doing my checks by the back side of the greenhouse area, when out of nowhere, a blood-curdling scream, and it's damn close. My body goes cold. This very well could be the big cat I suspected from a few nights earlier. I find the nearest gate and let myself into the greenhouse area. Better in there than out in the open. But then I hear crying. Unmistakably female, diaphragm shaking, snot slinging weeping. That's not a cat. I almost wish it was. But I have to look. That's my job. Now, behind the greenhouse area, there's a dirt road in front of the center field that circles all the way around it. This road connects to the perimeter roads for the two side fields. Think of three big circles arranged in the loose shape of a triangle with the greenhouses in the middle. Well, this crying sounded like it was coming from that center road. I start to approach very slowly and can still hear it as clear as day. It's getting louder and louder the closer I get. It's almost nightmarish, until it just stops. So I stopped. I stayed there completely still for quite a long time, but there was nothing. People don't just stop sobbing. There's at least sniffling, maybe that hiccuping thing when you try to catch your breath, but it just went from wailing to nothing in one beat. After that, I always felt uncomfortable toward that back field. I heard the scream several more times after that, always around midnight, and always from that same area, but I never went to investigate after my initial experience. By this time, harvest has come and gone, and the fields are bare. I'm still needed, however, because they used the greenhouses throughout the winter. As the seasons change, so did my responsibilities. Rather than patrolling the fields, my focus was the greenhouses, not just for theft, but also ensuring that the heaters continue to work throughout the cold nights. To this end, I took to parking my jeep next to the greenhouse area so I didn't have to make the long trek through the snow from the security office to the greenhouses. I could see everything I needed to from my driver's seat, and my jeep heater was infinitely better than the little space heater in my office. I had a routine. Start the jeep, get it nice and hot, then turn it off. I kept my windows cracked, because security work at night is 50% listening for weird shit. I didn't have to listen hard. A loud bang immediately removed any drowsiness I may have had. Something just hit my vehicle. I don't get out immediately. I took a good look around, listen for footsteps, and check my mirrors frantically. But there's nothing. Then it happens again. Bang on the roof of my jeep, and dirt tumbles down my windshield. Someone's throwing dirt clumps at me. I call my supervisor and explain what's going on, and she says she's on her way and will be there in about half an hour, as she's working at another farm not too far away. I reach to the passenger seat and grab my spotlight, the big kind of spotlight, a thousand lumens, and allows me to see the back of every field the kind of spotlight that will land you in jail if you shine it at a plane. I hop out of my jeep and climb on the roof. It had to have come from the back field. I began panning back and forth with my handheld beam of daylight. I don't immediately see anyone, so I start with verbal commands. Come out. You're trespassing. Announce yourself. I'm authorized to use lethal force. Yada yada. There's no response. I stay posted up until my supervisor arrives. 
we decide to walk the perimeter of all three fields and found absolutely nothing. By this time, it's almost 3 a.m., and we were back at my Jeep talking and smoking. Then, a whistle, kind of like that playful two-tone whistle that says, I'm over here. My supervisor just gave me this look like, seriously. I told her that's the kind of thing I deal with at this place. She stuck around for the rest of the shift, but nothing else happened. It stayed quiet until Christmas Day when I picked up a shift for that sweet holiday pay. I opted to stay in the office for the sake of my Jeep. That's when the music started. Long, flowing classical music that you might hear playing quietly at a fancy party. I listened then stood up and listened some more. I walked to the doorway of the security office and stopped to listen again. It's still there. I stepped out and it stops. I pause to a dead silence. I step back into my office and I can hear it again. I poke my head out and it stops. I lean back in and it starts again. It was almost cartoonish. It went on for quite a while and gradually faded away. There's nothing in that old building that plays music, no radio, PA systems, and no one had forgotten a cell phone. It wasn't my phone, as I'd actually tried to record it, but I picked up nothing but a white noise. I walked outside on the off chance it was coming from miles away, but nothing. I only ever heard that music on Christmas Day. After that, I'd actually gotten permission to bring my husky to work, and he loved the farm, especially in the snow. But some nights, he wouldn't leave my side. He would actually growl at things I had no perception of, which you know is strange if you own a husky. The strangest thing about that place was you could just tell it was going to be a normal night or not when you got there. Some days the atmosphere was just different, a lot of other things happened there, but those weren't the big ones. If I get a decent response, I may share a few more stories from my time in the Marines, or during my time as a cop. Thank you for listening. I've only told a few people of this and posted it once in a glitch group, but I'm not sure if you can call it a glitch, paranormal, or just an explained, but here it is. I've always dreamt very vividly and had small things I've dreamt of actually happen months or years later, but nothing as big as this. I have had this reoccurring dream since I was about six or so up until I was in my mid-twenties. I'm now 38, by the way but I dreamt about seeing myself as a little girl on a carousel and waving to myself and being so happy. I was wearing a romper that were quite popular attire in the 80s for little girls and a pair of sandals. I always wondered why I would dream of this, like maybe something traumatic happened and my brain was trying to remember or some shit, but it turned out to be quite the opposite. So fast forward to 2018, I was at a fair with my family, and my boyfriend took our daughter, who was two and a half on the carousel. As I waited, taking pictures, being so giddy and happy, I didn't realize it at the time until I was going through the pictures later on, that it was that dream I had on and off for years. It was my future daughter I was seeing in my dreams all along, not myself. Same outfit and shoes, same overwhelmingly happy feeling for just a regular day at the fair. Everything was just the same. I cry just thinking about it. I know some people don't believe me, but I don't care. It's a magical thing that I experienced, and I pull up the photo of her from that day from time to time, and I'm just in complete shock over it to this day. What a wild and cool thing to experience. I'm thankful for places like this where I can share my experience with others openly. Thanks, Reddit. I'm a singer, so late nights are common for me. 
This night, I was driving myself and four bandmates home from a show. It's about a two-hour drive. We're jamming out to the radio and talking and everything is fine, until I get to the road that's over a big lake in our state. As soon as I hit that bridge, I felt uneasy. I didn't want to look like a weenie, so I didn't say anything to everyone else, until I saw the guy walking on the shoulder of the bridge, which is practically non-existent. I swerve a little to miss him, and the guys start asking if I was okay and why I swerved. When I said it was to miss the guy, everyone says, what guy? So I described him. He had on a dark jacket, camo cargo pants, dark shoes, and wet hair. No one saw him and they laughed it off. I saw him again just a few feet ahead and pointed him out, but no one sees him. I'm freaking out because he's there. A few miles ahead, I see him again. This time my drummer sees him too, and he said I wasn't kidding and describes his face because he turned this time. He described exactly what I saw. I started driving faster and he showed up every few miles. He'd turn his head and grin this scary ass grin. I almost started crying. Anyway. Once we got to the woods past the bridge, I thought we'd be fine, but he kept appearing until we got close to town. Then, he was gone. I've never seen him again. That was one of the scariest ghost encounters I've had. His hair and clothes were wet, so I'm guessing it was the spirit of someone who drowned in the lake and is sticking around to mess with people. But he scared me pretty bad. Hello everyone. I recently moved into an apartment with my boyfriend. We instantly fell in love with the place and the price. We got approved and moved in rather quickly. The place is in the college town area. There is a bar nearby, grocery stores, and fast food places, nothing out of the ordinary nor sketchy. On the day of our move-in, our landlord gave us our keys and briefed us on the neighbors. There are only four apartments in the complex. The landlord said they are very reserved for the most part. One neighbor is very scared of COVID-19, so they stay inside. The neighbor across from us seems to be very reserved as well. Now, I saved the best for last. Our bottom floor neighbor, Cal. As we're walking up towards our place, our landlord said, Oh yeah, that's Cal. He's very weird. My boyfriend and I looked at each other, like what the fuck does that mean? His windows and doors were wide open. The landlord explained that he did not have AC at that moment. We ignored it and continued unpacking. We had prior plans to leave town, so we did not spend the first few nights there. Upon arrival, we discovered why he was weird. When we first saw him, we said hello and made some comment about the weather. He seemed confused and disoriented, and said, Uh, ha, yeah, okay. As the days passed, we would say hi. He would reciprocate at times. It was obvious that he was socially awkward. If I pulled up into our parking lot and he saw me, he would scurry into his room. I thought it was unusual, but brushed it off. We thought that was the extent of his weird. Boy, were we fucking wrong. Slamming, shoving, and hitting of his own doors started at night. Only at night. The slamming and banging was so loud that it woke us up. When we got closer to our door, we heard him yelling. We finally understood why he was deemed weird. This continued for many nights in a row. We would notice that he just stands in the middle of the parking lot and talks to himself. If he sees me, he goes back inside. Things escalated this past weekend. It was late in the evening. We were chilling, watching TV when we heard a knock. We immediately knew who it was since Cal was chilling outside with the neighbors. My boyfriend answered the door, and Cal asked if, 
we had seen a nice young Asian woman walking around. My boyfriend said no, and he walked away. Last night, I came back home from visiting my family. Immediately after I came home, Cal went upstairs. My boyfriend answered the door, and he asked if we'd seen his mom walking around. My boyfriend sternly said no, and closed the door. To conclude, this morning at 6am, we heard an extremely loud knock. I awoke immediately. I went to the door and did not see anyone, though I saw a flashlight. I got really scared and woke my boyfriend up. We looked out and saw there was a police officer looking for Cal. From what we can make out, Cal called the police due to hearing a gunshot and a young woman scream. My boyfriend was up since 5am and he states that he did not hear any of that. At this point, we're on edge with this guy. If he comes upstairs again, we're going to tell him to ask the other neighbors. For a quick update, right as I finished typing this, the previous tenant texted me. He stated that Cal was really weird while they lived there as well. Cal would talk to himself. The previous tenant said he caught security camera footage of Cal going up the stairs near the door and started working out. Cal noticed the camera and went back downstairs. My boyfriend is officially in I wish a motherfucker would mode. I also forgot to mention, yesterday, before I left to visit my family, I heard someone say, hello, and shuffle around my front door. I can only imagine who it was. It creeped me out because it was right after my boyfriend left to golf. Also, my boyfriend told me that he heard Cal go up the stairs after the police left at 6am, and he heard him say hello, trying to get someone's attention. My plan is to call the non-emergency police line in the event he continues to be erratic towards us. I really hope it does not get to that point. Yes, I know this man is mentally ill. However, it does not negate the fact that he purposely tries to talk to us in the late hours of the night. Compassion is shown, but boundaries will be set. We did end up calling the police because we heard him yell and scream for help. The police came out and said they already knew about him. It seems like he's harmless, but we're still going to keep our distance for our safety and his. This is the story about how three US Marines were scared shitless within only a few hours, including myself. I have a friend who's really into the paranormal, like myself, Jake. It was October 2018, and we just wanted to go ghost hunting or explore supposedly haunted buildings and areas. We had been researching and decided our drive limit was four hours. I came across a place called the Devil's Tramping Ground. At the place, there is a circle in the woods that can't grow grass, and the trees make a circle around it. As the legend has it, the devil himself uses that circle of sand and dirt as a portal. He comes to earth at night and stomps on the ground, pacing back and forth. We read that if you try to sleep there, on the circle, you will hear a soothing female singing which will put you to sleep, and then you will wake up in a different location. So what did we do? brought tents, sleeping bags, chairs, and beer of course. Okay, back to the story. Jake and I were planning our trip, and another one of my buddies caught wind of it. My buddy's name was Nick. We were all set to go on Friday when we got out of work. We left base at around 4pm and didn't hit the road until roughly 8pm because we kept getting sidetracked at different stores. I'll skip right to the good part. We get off the highway, it's close to midnight. We have our GPS on, and it wants us to go down the only damn road with no street lights. Of course, we start driving down that narrow, dark road slowly, so we can find the clearing for the Devil's Tramping Ground. We read that there would be satanic symbols in front of the clearing written on the road. We had our eyes peeled. There was something odd about this road. I shit you not, we were being chased the entire way by about ten dogs and one black dog. 
Every dog was barking, except for that black dog. He kept appearing in the woods to the left of us and in front of us as we were driving, as if he was trying to turn us around. We found the symbols and knew it was there. The dogs hadn't followed us that far. We parked and got out with flashlights to scope out the area. I'm not gonna lie, it was extremely unsettling. We made our way up to the circle and thought, perfect, let's go get our shit. Fast forward about an hour, it's quiet. We have our tents set up in a circle, with our chairs set up surrounding our cooler. We were just telling ghost stories and drinking. Nothing really seemed to bother us other than the occasional twig snapping that sounded like footsteps and the feeling of being watched. We just chalked it up to the animals. It's 2 a.m. now. I start to hear voices all around me, and I'm not the only one. Nick and Jake heard it too. It felt like we were about to be jumped by a group of men surrounding us, but we knew whatever it was wasn't human. The voices stopped, and I shit you not, at the same time, the car light turned on. We went to the car to find all of the doors open. Unnerved, we slowly closed all the doors and went back to drinking. 2.30 a.m. comes along. We're all on edge. We're not even drunk at this point because of the events that just took place. Everyone was silent. I could hear and feel my heart beating out of my chest. You'll never believe it. We all heard beautiful humming coming from every direction. I wish I could describe how it sounded, but we knew that was not good. We all leaned as the singing was going on. Without one word spoken, we all got up and went to the car and got out of there. We then visited Lydia's bridge because it was nearby, and it said that Lydia walks the road on the bridge at night. We didn't see anything, and we slept in a nearby Walmart parking lot in the car. We went back the next morning to collect our things. My grandmother died last year. It wasn't the fact she was dying. I sat with her for several nights and held her hand and I was glad to be there for her once it became clear she wasn't going to make it out this time. But the last time I saw her, despite being made as comfortable as possible, she had a moment of clarity where she was suddenly afraid. Not that she was going to die, which she had been welcoming for some time, but that an off-the-cuff remark she'd made to one of my cousins a week earlier might have been taken the wrong way and cause him to be upset with her that after spending more of the last three years of her life in hospital than out was going to be one of her final coherent thoughts that she might have made one of her grandchildren even mildly unhappy. If she hadn't been drugged beyond any chance of mobility, I think she would have gone into full hysterics. It took my aunt and a nurse several minutes to calm her down, with the nurse honestly being the MVP as she told my grandmother how lucky she was to have such a large family that had been coming to see her over the last few weeks, who were all happy and healthy and doing well in life, and they all loved her. It was one of the most agonizingly beautiful moments of my life. I'm tearing up thinking about it, but I hope I can carry that memory with me forever. But it terrifies me that even hours from death, you can still carry that much fear inside you over something you regret and suddenly realize you will never be able to fix it. If you're listening to this, you might be wondering what she had said that she was so worried about. My cousin had brought his girlfriend with him to the hospital and she asked him in front of her if he thought she was the one. She was worried she might have embarrassed him. I don't think all homeless people are scary or bad intentioned or creepy. I do think my encounter with this homeless person was creepy, however. This happened in 2019. I was 25 at the time. I was living with my parents, sister, and my partner at the time, 
as we were saving up to buy a house. My parents' house was in a relatively big city in California, which has a big homeless population. The house was on a street that dead end to a park, which was a common hangout spot for homeless people. There was always homeless people walking by our house. Most of them never caused any problems. The other piece of backstory you need to know is that my sister is special needs. She, despite being 19 at the time, appeared both physically and mentally more like a 10-year-old. This particular day, my mom and I had taken her dogs to the vet. My partner was at work, and my dad was working in the backyard. This left my sister kind of alone in the house. When my mom and I came back from the vet, my sister opened the door and greeted us, saying, This is my friend, Julia. Behind her stood a woman who looked like she was probably in her 20s. She had my sister's socks on and was eating food from our house. This was confusing because the woman could have been a friend of my sister's as she wasn't a lot of programs for adults with special needs and we didn't necessarily know all of her friends. But my sister also has a limited vocabulary to explain situations with. So my mom says, Oh, you know my daughter. Julia says, We're getting to know each other. No. My mom then says, How are you getting to know her? Julia answers, Oh well, I just live on the corner. You live around the corner. No, I live on the corner. I needed a tampon, so your daughter let me in. At this point, my mom is speechless. I've never seen her speechless in my life. I'm whispering to her, get her out. Julia is kind of pacing around, grabbing more food from our kitchen. She's acting erratically like she's on drugs. I again tell my mom, get her the fuck out. My mom says, I know that, but what if she has a knife or a gun or something? I need to do it carefully. My mom follows Julia into the kitchen and says, I'm so sorry. You need to leave because I need to go run an errand. Julia ignores this request. At this point, I look in our bathroom where there's a pile of Julia's things. Again, my mom tells her she needs to leave. Julia agrees and goes into our bathroom and locks the door. She was in there for a while it felt like forever, but it was probably around five minutes. We were pretty certain she was doing drugs. Finally, Julia has all of her stuff and leaves, taking socks and snacks with her. I run to get my dad, and we all debrief. It seems like what we can get out of my sister is that Julia knocked on the door asking for a tampon, in which my sister lets her in, trying to be helpful. Julia then realizes she is practically alone with what looks like a child and takes full advantage, stealing clothes and shoes from us. We have a serious talk with my sister and tell her she can never open up doors for strangers, and we spend the next few months worrying that Julia would spread the news that our house was an easy house to get into. I was home alone when I was about 13. My mom was at work and my sister was at school while I skipped it as I always tended to do. It was about 1 p.m. when I picked up the phone to call my mom and this was back when landline phones were more common so it was one of those pick it up then dial ones. But as you know if you've picked up a landline phone mid conversation you'd then join that conversation or you could at least listen in if you had multiple phones in the house. We only had one phone in the house, and it was this one. The only TV that was on in the house was in my sister and I's room, and it wasn't loud enough at all to be heard downstairs where the phone was. This definitely fucked with me. I picked up the phone, and instead of a dial tone, I heard static, but it wasn't loud static, just the white noise you'd hear over the phone when it's quiet on the other line. I then heard the voice of a young English girl, which is also weird because I live in Scotland and I didn't know anyone from England. And she said, Can you put that down, please? To which I got a bit spooked and answered, What? Hello? And she didn't seem to hear me. 
or if she did, she didn't want to answer. She just kept saying, Please stop that. Don't do that. Put that down. Please stop. Please put that down. Don't touch that. In a sort of a calm voice, almost melancholic at first, but getting more and more upset, I asked again, Hello, who are you? And then heard the sound of a fabric rustling near the phone, like someone was shifting, and a grunt like a person would when getting up. I freaked out by all of this and just hung up the phone. I ran upstairs and didn't tell anyone until later that night, when I told my mom who lifted the phone herself and got a dial tone. She didn't believe me. She was just skeptical, but obviously disturbed by how upset I was over it. I think about it every so often and feel a bit sick. I didn't know what to do at the time. I just freaked out and bailed. But I can't help but feel I gotta listen in on something sort of horrible. The little girl sounded upset, and it sounded like there was someone with her. I don't know what I could have done, but I sure as shit didn't do it. This was 11 years ago now, and I've since moved out of that house and live in my own apartment. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email or post it to my subreddit. You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. Roz. Cassandra Wyatt, Travis Smith, Zoe D, Kat Philbin, Melissa Friesen, Lorna Clark, Kathy Richmond, Natasha Hensley, Jaleesa Ferguson, Leah McBride, Emily Pearson, Tyler Wilson, Lynn Meese, Kristen Birdall, Shaz, Betty Brantley, Candice Lee, Africa Winfield, Becca, Lydia Adams, Girl Veteran, Legends CBZ 69 2012 Katrina King Hospital Cakewalk Dirty Diana Quinta Siegel Shirley Porch Taylor Ruist Annalisa Petrie Jasmine Davis Janelle Jensen Jasper Roth Alex Monica Levelace James Gargano Sarah P Fire 05 Mad as a Felter Tierra Sanders, Melissa Kingery, Kitty Cat Luna 2, Chelsea Moffat, Ryan, Gabrielle, Jenny, Sarah, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Sam, Amanda Jane, Vampy Debs, October Gypsy, Rebecca, Erica B, Maribel De Luna, Lloyd Rash, Jennifer Jenkins, Kelly Townsend, Mary Wright, Tara Harris, Elizabeth Knapp, Eddie, Sean Gorman, Sue Gordon, Spider's Web, Kay, Christy, Absinthe Alice, Dina Kingery, Snowball Rathena, Lady Drackard, Brenda, Pretty Girl 215, Amber Davis, Sigma Cube X, Leticia Acklin, Ali O'Neill, Gina Eberhardt, Lilypad, Ashley Nicole, Sarah Chifalo, May 2nd, 2003, Bella Plays, 2006, Skin Crawler, Stephanie McLaren, Borderline Betty, Kuro, Top Off, Kelly Ann Bain, Michael O'Malley, Neil Kavanagh, The Dead Movie Society, Diana Johnston, Taya Atwell, Danielle, Possum Posse, Crafty Kel, Brooke, Scott McKenzie, Megan Abrams, Jane Wiggins, Jasmine Davis, Jack White, Your Pappy's Dilly, Emma Lisa, Tanya Ferguson, The Wendy, Ember Hops, Alexia Tuttle, Ram Beltran, Elizabeth Mayers, Unladylike 13, Pegasus Genesis, Sheila Grant 44, Sona, 
Scout Mom 405, Cheryl Duckworth, Ashley Bray, Angela Reeves, Kim Thompson, Brock Bollard, Nick Bigdowski, Jessica Lasley, Yennefer, Clary Scott, Timothy Stratton, Melissa Kingery, Shane Stevens, Serge Vargas, Bart in Real Life, April Jordanet, Lisa Prentice, Mason Hayes, Sarah Price, Jasmine Thomas, Angie Lindoff, Z Harris, Kirby Harris, Yolo Sapien, Lavina Cordelia, Misty Racour, Michelle Green, Dixie Busby, Paula Ferreira Nieves, Samantha Place, Donna Cox, Stephen Wheeler, Melissa Moore, Deshaun Edmondson, This Bad Kitty, Gloria, Christina Myway, Connie Sue, Carol Zaffirano, Merciful Humming, Kelsa Rundle, Ashley Juster, Vicki Howell, Joe Tozer, Zoe D, Nicholas Johnson, Kimmy Love. Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.